Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects by Giorgio Vasari Life of Andrea Verrocchio Painter, Sculptor, and Architect of Florence Andrea del Verrocchio a Florentine, was in his day a goldsmith, a master of perspective, a sculptor, a woodcarver, a painter, and a musician. But in the arts of sculpture and painting, to tell the truth, he had a manner somewhat hard and crude, as one who acquired it rather by infinite study than by the facility of a natural gift. Even if he had been as poor in this facility, as he was rich in the study and diligence that exalted him, he would have been most excellent in those arts which, for their highest perfection, require a union of study and natural power. If either of these is wanting, a man rarely attains to the first rank. But study will do a great deal, and thus Andrea, who had it in greater abundance than any other craftsman whatsoever, is counted among the rare and excellent masters of our arts. In his youth, he applied himself to the sciences, particularly to geometry. Among many other things that he made while working at the goldsmith's art were certain buttons for copes, which are in Santa Maria del Fiore at Florence. And he also made larger works, particularly a cup full of animals, foliage, and other bizarre fancies, which is known to all goldsmiths, and casts are taken of it, and likewise another, on which there is a very beautiful dance of little children. Having given a proof of his powers in these two works, he was commissioned by the Guild of Merchants to make two scenes in silver for the ends of the altar of San Giovanni from which, when put into execution, he acquired very great praise and fame. There were wanting at this time in Rome some of those large figures of the apostles which generally stood on the altar of the chapel of the Pope, as well as certain other works in silver that had been destroyed. Wherefore, Pope Sixtus sent for Andrea and with great favor commissioned him to do all that was necessary in this matter. And he brought the whole to perfection with much diligence and judgment. Meanwhile, perceiving that the many antique statues and other things that were being found in Rome were held in very great esteem, insomuch that the famous bronze horse was set up by the Pope at San Giovanni Laterano, and that even the fragments not to speak of complete works, which were being discovered every day, were prized. Andrea determined to devote himself to sculpture. And so, completely abandoning the goldsmith's art, he set himself to cast some little figures in bronze, which were greatly extolled. Thereupon, growing in courage, he began to work in marble. Now in those days, the wife of Francesco Tornaboni had died in childbirth, and her husband, who had loved her very much, and wished to honor her in death to the utmost of his power, entrusted the making of a tomb for her to Andrea, who carved on a slab over a sarcophagus of marble the lady herself, her delivery, and her passing to the other life. And beside this, he made three figures of virtues, which were held very beautiful, for the first work that he had executed in marble. And this tomb was set up in the Minerva. Having then returned to Florence with money, fame, and honor, he was commissioned to make a David of bronze, two braccia and a half in height, which, when finished, was placed in the palace with great credit to himself, at the head of the staircase, where the catena was. The while that he was executing the said statue, he also made that Madonna of marble, 
which is over the tomb of Messer Leonardo Bruni of Arezzo in San Croce. This he wrought when still quite young. For Bernardo Rossellino, architect and sculptor, who executed the whole of that work in marble, as has been said. The same Andrea made a half-length Madonna in half-relief, with the child in her arms, in a marble panel, which was formerly in the house of the Medici, and is now placed, as a very beautiful thing, over a door in the apartment of the Duchess of Florence. He also made two heads of metal, likewise in half-relief, one of Alexander the Great, in profile, and the other a fanciful portrait of Darius, each being a separate work by itself, with variety in the crests, armor, and everything else. Both these heads were sent to Hungary by the elder Lorenzo de Medici, the Magnificent, to King Matthias Corvinus, together with many other things, as will be told in the proper place. Having acquired the name of an excellent master by means of these works, above all through many works in metal, in which he took much delight, he made a tomb of bronze in San Lorenzo, wholly in the round, for Giovanni and Pietro di Cosomo de' Medici, with a sarcophagus of porphyry supported by four corner pieces of bronze with twisted foliage very well wrought and finished with the greatest diligence. This tomb stands between the chapel of the sacrament and the sacristy, and no work could be better done, whether wrought in bronze or cast, above all since at the same time he showed therein his talent in architecture, for he placed the said tomb within the embrasure of a window which is about five braccia in breadth and ten in height, and set it on a base that divides the said chapel of the sacrament from the old sacristy, and over the sarcophagus, to fill up the embrasure right up to the vaulting, he made a grating of bronze ropes in a pattern of mandorle, most natural, and adorned in certain places with festoons and other beautiful things of fancy, all remarkable and executed with much mastery, judgment, and invention. Now Donatello had made for the tribunal of six of the Mercanzia, that marble shrine which is now opposite to San Michael, in the oratory of Orsa Michel, and for this there was to have been made a San Thomas in bronze, feeling for the wound in the side of Christ. But at that time nothing more was done. For some of the men who had the charge of this wished to have it made by Donatello, and others favored Lorenzo Ghiberti. Matters stood thus as long as Donatello and Ghiberti were alive. But finally, the said two statues were entrusted to Andrea, who, having made the models and molds, cast them, and they came out so solid, complete, and well made that it was a most beautiful casting. Thereupon, setting himself to polish and finish them, he brought them to that perfection which is seen at the present day, which could not be greater than it is, for in St. Thomas we see incredulity and a too great anxiety to assure himself of the truth, and at the same time the love that makes him lay his hand in a most beautiful manner on the side of Christ, and in Christ himself, who is raising one arm and opening his raiment with a most spontaneous gesture, and dispelling the doubts of his incredulous disciple. There are all the grace and divinity, so to speak, that art can give to any figure. Andrea clothed both these figures in most beautiful and well-arranged draperies, which give us to know that he understood that art no less than did Donato, Lorenzo, and the others who had lived before him. Wherefore, this work will deserve to be set up in a shrine made by Donatello, and to be ever afterwards held in the greatest price and esteem.
Now the fame of Andrea could not go further or grow greater in that profession, and he, as a man who was not content with being excellent in one thing only, but desired to become the same in others as well by means of study, turned his mind to painting, and so made the cartoons for a battle of nude figures, very well drawn with the pen, to be afterwards painted in colors on a wall. He also made the cartoons for some historical pictures, and afterwards began to put them into execution in colors. But for some reason, whatever it may have been, they remained unfinished. There are some drawings by his hand in our book, made with much patience and very great judgment, among which are certain heads of women, beautiful in expression and in the adornment of the hair, which Leonardo da Vinci was ever imitating for their beauty. In our book, also, are two horses with the due measures and protractors for reproducing them on a larger scale from a smaller, so that there may be no errors in their proportions. And there is in my possession a horse's head of terracotta in relief, copied from the antique, which is a rare work. The very reverend Don Vicenzio Bergini has some of his drawings in his book, of which we have spoken above. Among others, a design for a tomb made by him in Venice for a doge, a scene of the adoration of Christ by the Magi, and the head of a woman painted on paper with the utmost delicacy. He also made for Lorenzo de' Medici, for the fountain of his villa at Careggi, a boy of bronze squeezing a fish, which the Lord du Cosimo has caused to be placed, as may be seen at the present day, on the fountain that is in the courtyard of his palace, which boy is truly marvelous. Afterwards, the building of the cupola at Santa Maria del Fiore, having been finished, it was resolved, after much discussion, that there should be made the copper ball which, according to the instructions left by Filippo Brunelleschi, was to be placed on the summit of that edifice. Whereupon the task was given to Andrea, who made the ball for braccia high, and, placing it on a knob, secured it in such a manner that afterwards the cross could be safely erected upon it, and the whole work, when finished, was put into position with very great rejoicing and delight among the people. Truly great were the ingenuity and diligence that had to be used in making it, to the end that it might be possible, as it is, to enter it from below, and also in securing it with good fastenings, lest the winds might do it damage. Andrea was never at rest, but was ever laboring at some work, either in painting or in sculpture, and sometimes he would change from one to another, in order to avoid growing weary of working always at the same thing, as many do. Wherefore, although he did not put the aforesaid cartoons into execution, yet he did paint certain pictures, among others, a panel for the nuns of San Domenico in Florence, wherein it appeared to him that he had acquitted himself very well. Whence, no long time after, he painted another in San Salvi for the monks of Vallombrosa, containing the baptism of Christ by San John. In this work, he was assisted by Leonardo da Vinci, his disciple, then quite young, who painted therein an angel with his own hand, which was much better than the other parts of the work. And for that reason, Andrea resolved never again to touch a brush, since Leonardo, young as he was, had acquitted himself in that art much better than he had done. Now Cosimo de' Medici, having received many antiquities from Rome, 
had caused to be set up within the door of his garden, or rather courtyard, which opens on the Via de Ginori, a very beautiful Marcius of white marble, bound to a tree trunk and ready to be flayed, and his grandson, Lorenzo, into whose hands there had come the torso and head of another Marcius, made of red stone, very ancient, and much more beautiful than the first, wished to set it beside the other, but could not, because it was so imperfect. Thereupon he gave it to Andrea to be restored and completed, and he made the legs, thighs, and arms that were lacking in this figure out of pieces of red marble, so well that Lorenzo was highly satisfied, and had it placed opposite to the other, on the other side of the door. This ancient torso, made to represent a flayed Marcius, was wrought with such care and judgment that certain delicate white veins, which were in the red stone, were carved by the craftsman exactly in the right places, so as to appear to be little nerves, such as are seen in real bodies when they have been flayed, which must have given to that work, when it had its original finish, a most lifelike appearance. The Venetians, meanwhile, wishing to honor the great valor of Bartolomeo da Bergamo, thanks to whom they had gained many victories, in order to encourage others, and having heard the fame of Andrea, summoned him to Venice, where he was commissioned to make an equestrian statue of that captain in bronze, to be placed on the Piazza di San Giovanni e Polo. Andrea, then, having made the model of the horse, had already begun to get it ready for casting in bronze, when, thanks to the favor of certain gentlemen, it was determined that Villano da Padova should make the figure and Andrea the horse. Having heard this, Andrea broke the legs and head of his model and returned in great disdain to Florence, without saying a word. The Signoria, receiving news of this, gave him to understand that he should never be bold enough to return to Venice, for they would cut his head off, to which he wrote in answer that he would take good care not to, because, once they had cut a man's head off, it was not in their power to put it on again, and certainly not one like his own, whereas he could have replaced the head that he had knocked off his horse with one even more beautiful. After this answer, which did not displease those signori, his payment was doubled, and he was persuaded to return to Venice, where he restored his first model and cast it in bronze. But even then he did not finish it entirely, for he caught a chill by overheating himself during the casting, and died in that city within a few days, leaving unfinished not only that work, although there was only a little polishing to be done, which was set up in the place for which it was destined, but also another which he was making in Pistoia, that is, the tomb of Cardinal Fortaguera, with the three theological virtues, and a God the Father above, which work was afterwards finished by Lorenzetto, a sculptor of Florence. Andrea was fifty-six years of age when he died. His death caused infinite grief to his friends and to his disciples, who were not few, above all to the sculptor Nanni Grosso, a most eccentric person both in his art and in his life. This man, it is said, would not have worked outside his shop, particularly for monks or friars, if he had not had free access to the door of the vault, or rather wine cellar, so that he might go and drink whenever he pleased, without having to ask leave. It is also told of him that once, having returned from Santa Maria Nuova, completely cured of some sickness, I know not what, he was visited by his friends, who asked him how it went with him. 
Ill, he answered. But thou art cured, they replied. That is why it goes ill with me, said he, for I would dearly love a little fever, so that I might lie there in the hospital, well attended and at my ease. As he lay dying, again in the hospital, there was placed before him a wooden crucifix, very rude and clumsily wrought, whereupon he prayed them to take it out of his sight and to bring him one by the hand of Donato, declaring that if they did not take it away, he would die in misery. So greatly did he detest badly wrought works in his own art. Disciples of the same Andrea are Pietro Perugino and Leonardo da Vinci, of whom we will speak in the proper place, and Francesco di Simone of Florence, who made a tomb of marble in the church of San Domenico in Bologna, with many little figures, which appear from the manner to be by the hand of Andrea, from a Ser Alessandro Tardaglia, a doctor of Amola, and another in San Pancrazio at Florence, facing the sacristy and one of the chapels of the church, for the Chevalier Messer Pietro Minerbetti. Another pupil of Andrea was Agnolo di Polo, who worked with great mastery in clay, filling the city with works by his hand, and if he had deigned to apply himself properly to his art, he would have made very beautiful things. But the one whom he loved more than all the others was Lorenzo di Credi, who brought his remains from Venice and laid them in the church of San Ambrogio, in the tomb of Sir Michel di Sion, on the stone of which there are carved the following words. Sir Michaelis de Sionis et Suorum and beside them, Hic asa jacent, Andreae virocii, qui obiit venetiis, mille quadrigenti, octoginta octo. Andrea took much delight in casting in a kind of plaster which would set hard, that is, the kind that is made of a soft stone which is quarried in the districts of Volterra and of Siena and in many other parts of Italy. This stone, when burnt in the fire, and then pounded and mixed with tepid water, becomes so soft that men can make whatever they please with it, but afterwards it solidifies and becomes so hard that it could be used for molds for casting whole figures. Andrea, then, was wont to cast in molds of this material such natural objects as hands, feet, knees, legs, arms, and torsi, in order to have them before him and to imitate them with greater convenience. Afterwards in his time, men began to cast the heads of those who died, a cheap method, wherefore there are seen in every house in Florence, over the chimney pieces, doors, windows, and cornices, infinite numbers of such portraits, so well made and so natural that they appear alive. And from that time up to the present, the said custom has been continued, and it still continues, with great convenience to ourselves, for it has given us portraits of many who have been included in the stories in the palace of Duke Cosimo. And for this, we should certainly acknowledge a very great obligation to the talent of Andrea, who was one of the first to begin to bring the custom into use. From this, men came to make more perfect images, not only in Florence, but in all the places in which there is devoutness, and to which people flock to offer votive images, or, as they are called, miracoli in return for some favor received. For whereas they were previously made small and of silver, or only in the form of little panels, or rather of wax, and very clumsy, in the time of Andrea 
they began to be made in a much better manner, since Andrea, having a very strict friendship with Orsino, a Florentine worker in wax, who had no little judgment in that art, began to show him how he could become excellent therein. Now the due occasion arrived in the form of the death of Giuliano de' Medici, and the danger incurred by his brother Lorenzo, who was wounded in Santa Maria del Fiore, when it was ordained by the friends and relatives of Lorenzo that images of him should be set up in many places, to render thanks to God for his deliverance. Wherefore, Orsino, among others that he made, executed three life-size figures of wax with the aid and direction of Andrea, making the skeleton within of wood, after the method described elsewhere, interwoven with split reeds, which were then covered with wax cloths, folded and arranged so beautifully that nothing better or more true to nature could be seen. Then he made the heads, hands, and feet with wax of greater thickness, but hollow within, portrayed from life, and painted in oils with all the ornaments of hair and everything else that was necessary. So lifelike and so well wrought that they seemed no mere images of wax, but actual living men, as may be seen in each of the said three one of which is in the church of the nuns of Chiarito in the Via di San Gallo, opposite to the crucifix that works miracles. This figure is clothed exactly as Lorenzo was when, with his wounded throat bandaged, he showed himself at the window of his house before the eyes of the people, who had flocked thither to see whether he were alive, as they hoped, or to avenge him if he were dead. The second figure of the same man is in the Luco, the gown peculiar to the citizens of Florence, and it stands in the Servite Church of the Nunziata, over the lesser door, which is beside the counter where candles are sold. The third was sent to Santa Maria degli Angeli at Assisi, and set up before the Madonna of that place, where the same Lorenzo de' Medici as has already been related, caused the road to be paved with bricks all the way from Santa Maria to that gate of Assisi, which leads to San Francesco. Besides restoring the fountains that his grandfather, Cosimo, had caused to be made in that place. But to return to the images of wax, all those in the said Servite church are by the hand of Arsino, which have a large O in the base as a mark, with an R in it, and a cross above. And they are all so beautiful that there are few since his day who have equaled him. This art, although it has remained alive up to our time, is nevertheless rather on the decline than otherwise, either because men's devoutness has diminished, or for some other reason, whatever it may be. And to return to Verrocchio, besides the aforesaid works, he made crucifixes of wood, with certain things of clay, in which he was excellent, as may be seen from the models for the scenes that he executed for the altar of San Giovanni, from certain very beautiful boys, and from a head of San Jerome, which is held to be marvelous. By the hand of the same man, as the boy on the clock of the Mercato Nuovo, who has his arms working free, in such a manner that he can raise them to strike the hours with a hammer that he holds in his hands, which was held in those times to be something very beautiful and fanciful. And let this be the end of the life of that most excellent sculptor, Andrea Verrocchio. There lived in the time of Andrea, one Benedetto Buglioni, who received the secret of glazed terracotta work from a woman related to the house of Andrea della Robbia. Wherefore, he made many works in that manner 
both in Florence and abroad, particularly a Christ rising from the dead, with certain angels which, for a work in glazed terracotta, is beautiful enough. In the church of the Servi, near the chapel of Santa Barbara, he made a dead Christ in the chapel of San Pancrazio, and the lunette that is seen over the principal door of the church of San Pietro Maggiore. From Benedetto, the secret descended to Santi Buglioni, the only man who now knows how to work at this sort of sculpture. <laughs>